Welcome to our lecture on Lord Byron. This is the last selection in our semester devoted to the early modern shading off into the high modern period. We have been dealing with this transition from enlightenment to romanticism over the last several weeks. We've had Rousseau, who's really the figure that, that most embodies this um, transitional phase, which comes up again with Lord Byron insofar as the ideals of enlightenment are not necessarily rejected by the romantics. It depends on which romantic we're talking about. And still, romanticism, even though it's a reaction to enlightenment in some senses, is also picking up on very strong currents that are there in the Enlightenment. Kant follows Rousseau, uh, who in the Reveries of a Solitary Walker talks about the, um, the, the abundant feelings of self-consciousness that are evoked in nature. Kant draws on this in the understanding that in the noumenal realm, in the, the, where we're not talking about what is describable by S Newtonian science, there's this whole realm of freedom, of, of a kind of um, exuberant, rational um, uh, feeling that creates new political order. Um, it does, as Kant want, well, what, what Kant wants is to bring about a, a solution for that um, bind that Rousseau presents at the beginning of the social contract. Man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. Kant's whole philosophy is a philosophy of freedom that is also at the same time meant to uh, support the findings of Newtonian science. So he's trying to walk a tightrope. And then the third figure that we've had before this transitioning from enlightenment to romanticism is Madame de Stahl, who is one of the great liberals in the, the political sense of, of caring about the rights of man and um, equal, political equality and being Republican, meaning anti-monarchical. And she also brings in this question of feeling and emotion and passions and how we can um, live this heightened sense of individuality that we've got as moderns, as, as romantics still as we are now, this we've reached the final phase here with the Romantic period of the creation of our sense of interiority, of how we experience the world. We've seen this all through the medieval period, uh, from, well, actually from the beginning of philosophy on, we, we get this growing sense of individuation and the, the increasing um, need to, to feel our self-consciousness as politically relevant, for instance. So we're going from reform, as we started the semester off with Luther, all the way to revolution, because of course the central fact, the histor central historical fact of the last few centuries is the French Revolution, even if we might bemoan the fact that it isn't the American Revolution that set the template for these, these, these massive uh, political passions that have been unleashed. So Byron was born in 1788. He dies at the age of 36 in 1824. He puts before us, he, well, actually, he's the first real celebrity, and we, we're very used to the culture of celebrity, but he was the first one, he says, on the publication of the first two cantos of the work that we, of which we have the third canto in this, um, for the Great Conversation, Child Harold's Pilgrimage. Uh, on the publication of the first two cantos, he said, I awoke one morning and found myself famous. And he was, and he was, a, he was the rock star of the age. And later we would get great musicians like uh, Franz Liszt and Paganini. Uh, these would be the next celebrities, but uh, Byron was, was the first. And so he, he really encapsulates with the thing that he would draw uh, often in his poems, this figure of the Byronic hero, who was um, a literary figure of his devising, but also was himself. Because of course the great subject of Byron's poetry was his own interiority. And that brings us to the question I would like to have us think about. Does a romantic personality facilitate a more enlightened life? And this I mean both individually and, and socially. Uh, again, dealing with this fact that enlightenment and romanticism, even though they seem to be in a way opposites, they are in fact 
dealing with the same set of uh, modern yearnings that we ha all have for um, a free and democratic life, for the ability to, um, for the individual to have a say. Now, that's said differently for the Enlightenment and for the Romantics, so there's that difference, but still there's a common agenda. But if we unleash the passions and if we let self-consciousness be the, uh, the criterion, does that end up defeating the possibility for the Enlightenment uh, Republican, little r Republican project of, of self-government? Or, or in fact, does that project require this unleashing of um, sensibility, of this moral uh, earnestness that comes out as passion? Uh, again, the background, I said last time we were dealing with the first part of the French Revolution. We have to do quickly uh, the rest of it because as, as Byron is living his life, um, it, is, it is as Napoleon takes over uh, in, the, in those, those revolutionary events of France. So we have the Reign of Terror. You can date it differently, but 1793 to 1794. Uh, Robespierre says, who, who's the leader of the Jacobins, Virtue without terror is impotent, so that was his excuse for, of course, um, the elimination of the Girondins and uh, the counter-revolutionaries as they saw it, leading to the deaths of tens of thousands. Uh, of course, at the same time, in fueling the ability to, to put this terror into place, to send so many people to Madame Guillotine, is the fact that the uh, reactionary uh, governments of Europe were attacking France. So again, that didn't help the cause of moderation. Uh, the Committee of Public Safety was set up to both reconstruct society, de-Christianize it. That triggered, of course, the War of the Vendée and other, there was a lot of bloodshed. So you have in, external enemies that, that uh, allow the radicals in the Jacobins to then turn against what they see as internal enemies. Uh, the madness gets, eats all of its children. Robespierre himself goes to the guillotine and then in 1795, after the Thermidorian reaction, you have the setting up of the Directory, which reverts more to an earlier phase of the revolution, uh, less radical. But then uh, the Revolutionary Wars continue, uh, partly because the Directory needs to, con uh, needs to keep doing the imperialist expansion in order to deal with the fact that the debt, which has always been there, um, Madame de Stahl's father had to deal with it. That, that, none, of that problem, none of those problems went away. Uh, eventually, one of the leaders of the director, Barras, calls in Napoleon, this brilliant young uh, artillery um, uh, uh, man who comes from poor but minor nobility in Corsica. Napoleon uh, ends up then doing a coup in 1799 and setting up what he calls, setting himself up as first consul. So it sounds like the Roman Republic. Okay. Uh, every liberal-minded, little L, liberal, I mean, the, in the old sense, the progressive factions of, the progressive feeling of Europe is stirred by this, this young, brilliant general. And uh, so you have uh, Beethoven dedicating his third symphony, the Eroica, to this man. But then, uh, in 1804, he crowns himself emperor, and then a lot of people that did support him realize, oh, he's just another monarchy. Of course, if you want to be a Republican, you are a Republican, you've got to be against one man rule. So that was, but what the, the paradox he presented is that as he invaded other nations in Europe, he would abolish serfdom. He abolished the Ancien Regime. So that all of this looks good to those who want uh, progress and social um, relations. He, he ended up abolishing the Holy Roman Empire. We've been talking about this for, for many sessions going way back. This thing that Charlemagne had instituted, that, that was finally destroyed by Napoleon. Um, so after the coup, he sets up a new law code, which, which rationalizes things, but then is also retrograde. It's not good for uh, women's rights, um, and it's not good for workers, but the code of Napoleon is important in far, as far as being a rational uh, system of laws that does eliminate uh, the privilege of the aristocracy and of the church. He does, though, form a concordat with the Catholic Church, uh, Pope Pius VII, 
which um, allows Napoleon to neutralize a lot of the the real fervor, the counter-revolutionary fervor had to do with those people who really cared about the position of the Catholic Church and the freedom of the Church. So with that Concordat, he was able to neutralize that internal pressure. And then he embarks on, after the Revolutionary Wars close, um, with the, the Peace of Amiens, you now then have uh, an opening of this next phase, the Napoleonic Wars, where he's, he's going all over the con continent with his strategic genius and winning defeating uh, Austria and Russia and so on. But he gets humbled by um, Lord Nelson at Trafalgar. That makes it impossible for him to take over Britain. It's never really possible in the end for him to invade England because at the Battle, Battle of Trafalgar, the British Navy uh, has asserts its um, dominance and that's a dominance that will last for a century. Uh, he has to fight the Peninsular War on the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, Arthur Wellesley, who will later be uh, the Duke of Wellington, who will in the end defeat Napoleon, he, he's taking the lead there in fighting uh, Napoleon's forces on the Iberian con uh, Peninsula. Uh, dealing with England after being defeated at Trafalgar meant that uh, Napoleon needed a new strategy. He formed what he what was called the continental system that meant an embargo against uh, England and that but England of course was uh, precocious in the production of manufactured goods the continent needed those goods so it was very painful to do this part of the thought was that Napoleon was trying to stimulate homegrown manufacturing by, by taking away that source but the, the, the hope was to bring uh, Britain to its knees because it would stop trade. It did allow for a freer trade on the continent, so you have kind of a European Union thing going on in a, in a new in a incipient form. Uh, Russia, though, tended to ignore the, the continental system. So this had problems on the edges. The, the um, neutral nations like the United States uh, couldn't sell couldn't trade with England, and that led eventually to the War of 1812. Russia eased out of the system, didn't really participate in the continental system, and therefore Napoleon, to um, exact revenge, launches his invasion, which is immortalized in Tolstoy's book, War and Peace. He invades Russia with 600,000 men. A third of them are French, but the others are levied from defeated lands on the continent. Of course, in the end, he is... Um, He's swallowed up by the Russian winter. Uh, the Moscow, the, the fire that burns down Moscow means that they have no uh, grain to, to survive. They weren't equipped with winter clothing, so they go back and it, it, I think the army's down to 100,000 by the time they get back. So it's, it's a, that's the beginning of the end for Napoleon. Uh, the Battle of the Nations in 1813 at Leipzig uh, had uh, Napoleon defeated by the the British, Austrians, and Prussians, and, and Russians. And so he abdicates in 1814. It's an exile to Elba in the Mediterranean. But then he comes back the next year and makes another play for, um, to, to, well, for European dominance. It ends up in the Battle of Waterloo on June 18th is the climax where, uh, the Duke of Wellington has to hold on while the Prussian forces under Blücher are, are trying to fight their way to get to him. Um, if they hadn't gotten there that evening, it would have been over. So it was a very close run battle, but uh, Napoleon loses. He's exiled now, to, not to the Mediterranean, but into a very tough island in the uh, Atlantic called St. Helena. So that was that. Um, there were many romantics who still held, many who felt betrayed, but many who felt that uh, Napoleon was still this, the great symbol of um, a transformation of European social life. Byron was one of those. The Congress of Vienna wraps up the revolutionary and Napoleonic periods. Uh, the forces of counter-revolution do kind of win, except, you know, it's very, very telling that even in France, Reaction wins, but you get a monarch on the throne who is 
uh, has to be now bound by a constitution. He's a constitutional monarch. It's not the same as under Louis XIV anymore. Bourgeois demands, meaning the middle class now has felt its power, felt what it could do, and those demands are going to rise throughout the 19th century. The demands for the rights of man to be recognized, uh, even, un, even though the Ancien Regime kind of has a recrudescence with the Congress of Vienna. These forces are unleashed by Napoleon nationalism and liberalism, meaning accountable government, uh, free, uh, the right to free press, uh, the vote, uh, these are the equality under the law. These, of course, are irresistible kinds of demands. Now, all, alongside of all of this is something we haven't really talked much about. We have to kind of leave to next semester. It's the Industrial Revolution, and that's really relevant for the Romantic period, too, because uh, mechanized spinning, that is the production of, of textiles in England, it starts with England, is already happening in the 1780s. Uh, you then get steam power and uh, iron production in the, in the early 1800s. You're getting a lot of pollution. You're getting now a shift to a care for nature, meaning the thing we usually think of now, walking in nature. And that's all part of the matrix that, that gives rise to the romantic reaction. 1798 sees the publication of Wordsworth and, Wordsworth and Coleridge's poems, lyrical ballads, and that's the literary kind of starting point for romanticism. You have Wordsworth, Coleridge, Blake is kind of the first generation of romantics, and then a generation later, you've got John Keats, Percy Shelley, and then Lord Byron, the man we've got here. Byron, oh, before I get there, I don't want to miss Wordsworth's quote, summing up, and Wordsworth ends up being kind of conservative towards the end of his life, so he's one who, who sees the, the mess that the French Revolution does end up, but he, in the prelude, he's thinking back to the early days of the Revolution and says, bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven, and that was the kind of feeling Romantic and Enlightenment, all of it together, right? Byron was, um, he was born with a club foot. He, he disciplined his body so that he could try to overcome that, so he couldn't ever walk properly, but he, he became a great sportsman. He could ride and shoot and swim. He actually swam the Dardanelles at one point. I mean, he was, and he was a, a beautiful man. He had the dark hair and the and the fashionable uh, clothes. He was dashing, and he was promiscuous, polymorphously so. I mean, one doesn't want to get too much into it. Lots of um, uh, lots of um, unhappy loves, especially for the women involved. One of his lovers said, he, and that's a, a great quote. He was mad, bad and dangerous to know, which does kind of sum up Byron. Uh, he was, as because of his mother's side, he belonged to the nobility and therefore uh, had access to becoming part of the House of Lords. So that was, uh, he was a member of the House of Lords and his maiden speech there in, in the parliament was a speech against the Frame Breaking Act, which was um, going to impose capital punishment on the Luddites who sabotage machinery. Again, this is all part of the, the Industrial Revolution and the pains, that, uh, the very painful transition that that involved. But that, the same, that same year, after he gave that maiden speech, the publication of the first two cantos of the Child Herald's Pilgrimage made him a celebrity, and he realized, I'm going to be a poet instead of a politician, so that's where he went. Uh, he got married uh, to Annabelle Milbank in 1815. Their daughter, Augusta Ada, is born at the end of the year. The next year, uh, Annabelle is already tired of his uh, philandering, which involved probably his half-sister, Augusta Lee. So under the pressure of the separation and the, um, the, the fomenting divorce, the divorce that's, that's underway, uh, the rumors about his half-sister and himself and uh, the pressure of the debt collectors because he ran up huge debts. He left England in 1816 and never to return. Child Harold's Pilgrim, and that puts us here in the poem in this, our selection. Child, C-H-I-L-D-E, which is the title here, is was a it's a medievalizing term. So one of the hallmarks of romanticism was to it's too much to say they preferred the medieval to the uh, classical, but they did love the medieval. So that was, here we're seeing something different from um, 
the the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, which really is trying to go back behind the medieval period. Well, the Romantics now are trying to take that up too. And, and that did mean, yes, there was a kind of soft spot for Catholicism and for religiosity um, amongst many of them. A uh, child in this sense was someone who, uh, a young man who was in the line um, for knighthood. So the poem as a whole, there's four cantos. The first two were published in 1812. This next one, Canto Three, the one that we have in our book, is written in 1816 while he's, he, he's left England, fled England. He goes, and what it describes is this. So the first canto is about Portugal and Spain, that, and, and here he's describing the Peninsular War that, that Duke, uh, Arthur Wellesley is engaged with against the French. Canto two is about Greece, and that's going to loom large in his own life because he will, well, as we see, that's, that's how he ends his life. Canto three starts, and this is the poem, the part of the poem we've got. It starts uh, in what we now know as Belgium, on the field of Waterloo, where Napoleon met his end. Uh, Byron is being very coy. He doesn't really talk about the battle itself. He talks about a, a, a preliminary scourge, a, a skirmish at Quatre Bras. Um, he doesn't put all his cards on the table. He's in fact very sympathetic to Napoleon, but he doesn't say that there. He's, he's writing a poem that can still be seen by those who are uh, proud Englishmen to be something that they want to read and talk about. But it's, it's, a, very, it's a very cleverly done kind of um, balancing act. So he starts in the field of Waterloo, he goes up the Rhine, and eventually ends up in, uh, Lake, in Switzerland on the shores of Lake Geneva. That put, gives him a chance to think about Rousseau and Voltaire and Gibbon. So these Enlightenment figures, again, so this man loves the Enlightenment. He thought of it, he loved Napoleon because he thought of Napoleon still to the end as the, uh, the great motor that could bring about rationalism and Enlightenment, could defeat tyranny. That's the way Byron saw it um, to the end. He meets Shelley and Mary Shelley, who would write Frankenstein, uh, on this journey. They hang out together. They really they work together. Uh, Mary Shelley writes Frankenstein during this time. Uh, he also at the same time is is spending uh, is is frequenting the Cope, uh, Chateau Copé uh, that Madame de Stal had set up again because she had to flee once Napoleon had come back in 1815. And she ends up back there for some time. And Byron thinks very highly of, of Madame de Stahl. So there's this, this great ferment. He's writing Canto Three, And then Canto Four comes out a couple of years later, and that's about Italy. He ends up um, it, later in his life in Venice. He's got a menagerie of animals there. He's, he basically founds the field of Armenology, the study of Armenia, uh, Armenian uh, language and history. And he, but finally, he goes to Greece. He fights, um, or he wants to fight for Greek independence from the Ottoman Empire. He uses his money to try to, well, as humanitarian aid, he helps the Greeks materially. Really does tries to unite factions. The, the Greeks always, this is all the way back in the beginning. They're always factionalized, and it, and he couldn't get it done before he died of a fever in Missolonghi, before. Um, his plan to uh, lead a personally lead a, a charge at Lepanto. Greece still considers him a great national hero. They they call him Megalos Kaikalos, the great and beautiful, fine uh, man. Okay, just a few words about the poem itself. It it is written in Spenserian stanzas. That is, uh, it has this regular rhyme scheme where the first and the third lines are rhymed. The, the second and the fourth and fifth and, and the seventh, the eighth are rhymed and so on. So they're iambic uh, pentameter. I'm not gonna do the first line because it's a little uh, odd. I have not flattered its break breath nor bowed to, to its idolatry. To its 
idolatries of patient need. So, ba bump, I am, iambic is unstressed, stressed, ba bump, ba bump, five times, ba bump, ba bump, ba bump, ba bump. And then the last line is a, an Alexander, which is a, six of those feet. Uh, had I not filed my mind, which thus itself subdued. Uh, we don't read it um, that way. That's just the way that to know meter is a thing that helps the poet write a thing. It also gives you a sense of order underneath. I have not loved the world nor the world me. I have not flattered its rank breath nor bowed to its idolatries of patient me, nor coined my cheek to smiles, nor cried aloud in worship of an echo. In the crowd, they could not deem me one of such. I stood among them, but not of them, in a shroud of thoughts which were not their thoughts and still could. Had I not filed my mind, which thus itself subdued. Now that's a great stanza which gives the romantic sense. And the Byronic hero of standing apart from the crowd, he's burdened down with a secret past and secret sin. He's he's self-destructive and he's passionate and he's 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 larger than life. That that's the Byronic hero. And that's so much of what we think of as the romantic um, personality. So the Spencerian stanzas, it's written very regularly with that meter, it's written with that rhyme scheme, and um, that'll help you um, parse the thing. And the other thing is that the, uh, the, the language is sometimes archaized in the way that Spencer, so Edmund Spencer is the one who created this, wrote The Great Fairy Queen, is a contemporary of Shakespeare. So again, Byron, who is this most modern, romantic person, he's going back to the past. And that's the kind of thing that you can see with Byron, he contains worlds. And that's where I want to leave us, is, is thinking about the kinds of persons we really do feel ourselves this, in this romantic way, that our, our sense of self-consciousness has been, has been amped up, that it has a move beyond the Enlightenment, because we, we're definitely very introspective, that's not the Enlightenment way. But we also, I think... Or, or not. I mean, has this romanticism taken us out of the political project? Do we care about little r republicanism? That's the kind of question that I'm interested in, in pursuing, whether um, this, this cultivation and unleashing of passions is something that's reconcilable with a, a project that cares about the common good. Mm-hmm.